everybody and welcome to this my first of two videos on the Canon AE-1 and this is an update with corrections to an older video that I made that has uh, now been taken offline and a thank you to Joe at SLR35 for sending me an email with some corrections to my previous video so let's get going the Canon AE-1 is an interchangeable lens 35 millimeter SLR what that means is that the lens can be taken off of the camera and a different one can be put on at any time when you're not taking a photo without ruining any of your images. And 35 millimeter is the size of film that it uses and any 35 millimeter film will work in this camera. It has a, what Canon's exact words are, a central emphasis averaging meter. That's a fancy way of saying center weighted. Now what that means is that the meter on this camera biases, biases the exposure towards what's in the center of the frame. So looking at the video screen right now, what is in the center of the frame here is fairly dark. So an area about like what's inside of my fingers will provide roughly 70% of the exposure data and what's outside of it will provide the remaining 30-ish. It's approximate percentages, I couldn't find the exact numbers. So if you have something really dark in here, what's on the outside will be a little bit brighter. Likewise, if you have something really, really bright in the center, what's on the outside, assuming that it's gray, let's say, will be a little bit darker. So your camera is going to expose for what's in the center of the frame. And if you're shooting, let's say, a picture of a person and you put their face in the center of the frame, you're going to end up with a fairly good exposure for that person's face. Shutter speeds on this camera are two seconds up to one one thousandth of a second and bulb. Bulb means that when you push the button down, the shutter stays open until you let it go. The viewfinder has magnification of 0.86x with 93.5% vertical coverage and 96% horizontal. Now what that means, 0.86 means what you see in the viewfinder is 86% the size of what's going to end up on the film. So it's a slightly smaller image than what will be on the film. The 93.5% vertical and 96% horizontal frame coverage means that vertically you're going to lose 6.5% of the frame somewhere off the top and bottom and horizontally you're going to lose 4%, probably about 2% on each side, maybe a little bit more on this side where the light meter is. And that's, that's decent. It gives you a little bit of room to crop in post uh, when you're making your prints or after you've digitized your film. It also means that there's going to be a little bit more outside of the image than what you see in the viewfinder. So that gives you a little bit of room to play with the images when you get them back. The, it has a split prism focusing screen and the flash on this sinks at 1 60th of a second which we know because when we set it to 1 60th there's a little lightning bolt next to the 60th that tells us that is our fastest flash sync. Any of the slower shutter speeds can also use flash and we'll talk about why that is in the second video. The Canon AE-1's target market was the mid-market amateur. So not intended to be a professional camera, but it was intended to be a step up from the entry level cameras for amateurs. We know this because it introduced a new tier of amateur cameras into the A lineup from Canon. And the shutter priority shooting was pretty advanced at the time, but would have been more geared at people who didn't want to have to fiddle with full manual exposure for every shot. So what this camera lets you do is set your lens to A or green dot for the even older automatic lenses, select a shutter speed, and then the camera will pick the best aperture based on your shutter speed, assuming that there is enough light for that proper exposure. It was made by Canon in Japan from 1976 to 1978, so only two years. It was preceded by nothing directly as this camera introduced shutter priority mode or a camera that had shutter priority as the intended default to the Canon lineup. 
It was concurrent with the F1, F1N, EF, and AT1, and it was followed by the AE1 program, though there was a little bit of a lag between the end of this camera's production and the AE1 program going into production. Uh, some quick notes on this camera. It is, a, it is slightly better built than the AE-1. It has a metal base here. The AE-1 has a plastic base. And it is a slightly heavier and a bit more rugged. The AE-1 has a better viewfinder, adds pro, or the AE-1 program has a better viewfinder, adds program mode, and also has a little bit of a um, cover here for the battery chamber. This camera does have two major weaknesses. And the first one is the battery chamber which originally these came with a hot shoe cover that you would use as a key to open up the battery chamber. But many, many of these have broken battery chambers and the parts for that uh, are getting harder and harder to find. And I don't know of a reliable 3D printed option yet. The other weakness is in the electronics. And increasingly, uh, I see a good number of these a year. And over the last year especially, I have seen these coming in with an increasingly high rate of failed flexes. The flex is the electronic part that comes along the top over the prism and down. That's the, the term for the electronic component here. The flex, once it goes, the camera is shot. There's, it becomes uneconomical to repair because you have to go find a camera with a working flex, take it out of that and put it in this one. At that point, you might as well just buy the working camera. So the electronics on these are becoming increasingly unreliable with, with time. And that's a, that, that's a difference. If, that, if I'd made this video two years ago, I would not have been telling you that. But two years ago, I was seeing around 3% of the AE1s come in with bad flexes. This last year, year and a half, it's been around 10 or 11%. And that's a dramatic enough increase that I don't think it's just a statistical anomaly. So, uh, if you have your Canon AE-1, we're going to go over the features on this camera, talk about what everything is. In the second video, we'll talk about what it does and how to use it. So, we'll start here on the front with the strap lugs. This is where you connect your camera strap. Film rewind knob and lever. So, when you want to rewind your film, you use this in conjunction with the film rewind button on the bottom, which we'll see better in video two. And just rewind it in the direction of the arrow. Film plane indicator, that's the symbol here, serial number, battery check button, flash hot shoe. This is your shutter lock right here, can't use the shutter. Automatic or active mode, self timer. When, and you can tell that because there's an S here and a little index on the switch. So that goes to self timer. And then on the back, there's an A, uh, here, uh, there you can see it, there's an A and a lock. Self timer basically just counts down, light flashes, and at the end of the countdown time, the shutter trips. Show you what that looks like. There we go. If you accidentally hit the self timer and you want to cancel it, you can't. Because switching out of the self timer triggers the shutter. So once you, when you use the self timer, once you start that, you are locked into having the exposure happen. Frame count window, shutter speed selection dial right here, film advance lever, and then here we have the ISO selection, or ASA it was called at the time that this camera was made. Dial, set that back to 400. ASA and ISO are the exact same thing. So if you take your modern film, and you see that it's 400, it might say ISO on here somewhere, does it? Yeah, it doesn't. Anyway, um, if you take a 400 ISO film, the ASA number is exactly the same as ISO. When ISO took over the standardization of film from ASA, they just kept the numbering system and just made it a combined ISO and DIN. So you can see here that this says 400 slash 27. 400 is the ISO, 27 is the DIN. DIN was the older German uh, standard. So they kept both to make the Europeans and the Americans happy. On the front of the camera, not a ton here, we have the model number, battery chamber here, lens mount, the 
backlight control switch is the silver button right here. So basically with the backlight control switch, if you have a subject, a person you're taking a photo of sitting say under an awning and then there's a beach in the background, you push this and the beach will be overexposed but your subject will be properly exposed. Exposure preview switch is the black button here which will give you the exposure uh, readings. This is your stop down lever right here. So you can push this in to get your depth of field preview. And I will show you in the second video how to use this for stop down metering with older FL lenses. And then when you're done getting your depth of field preview, just push that little silver button there that's revealed and that ends the DOF preview. Do not, for any reason, mount a lens on this camera if you can see that red dot in the viewfinder or that silver button. If you mount a lens when your DOF preview is set like this, you can damage your camera and at minimum you will not be able to use your lens properly until you've taken it back off and mounted it properly. And I'm doing it now, but we'll see officially how to mount lenses in the second video. On the back of the camera, we don't have a whole lot. We have the viewfinder. These are accessory grooves for different things that fit into the viewfinder, right there on the outside of the viewfinder. And then the film memo holder right here. On the camera's bottom, we have electronic contacts for the motor drive, tripod socket, Canon Japan, film re rewind button, mechanical contact under here for the film winder, and it doesn't rewind, it only winds the film on this model, but there's the mechanical contact. And then we have an aligning pin to make sure that everything for the winder goes in correctly, if it, um, and that's that. On the inside of the camera, which you access by pulling up the film rewind knob here, now we're going to lift it and it pops the film back open film cassette chamber. These silver rails on the inside and outside are film guide rails. What these do is these help keep the film moving smoothly in the camera. And when we have our cassette in here and we pull it forward, these two on the inside line up with the sprocket holes and help keep the film flat. When the film pressure plate, which we'll see in a minute, closes over the film back, it sandwiches the film flat. Then these ones on the top and bottom keep the film from moving up and down if they weren't there, theoretically, you could have your film moving through the camera like this, and that would really be a problem. So um, at least for a couple frames until you ruined your film and possibly broke your camera. So those uh, top and bottom guide rails are incredibly important. And next we have over here the film tension sprocket. Now you saw the sprocket holes, and what the film tension sprocket does is it helps to advance the film through the camera, keeping tension on it. You can see it doesn't roll backwards right now so that the film doesn't move backwards. Film, as it's, as it's stored in a cassette, develops a memory. It wants to curl back on itself. So if you can imagine, this is basically a big spring. And if your film wants to curl, it's gonna to try to pull itself back through the camera. And that could cause your frames to overlap this sprocket not only prevents that from happening, it helps pull it forward evenly. Film take-up spool, we'll see how to use this in video too. Shutter curtain, of course. Here we have a film guide roller. The sandwiches, if we envision the film back when it's closed, this roller sandwiches right here to help keep tension on the film with the film sprocket. Film pressure plate right here which is what keeps the film flat. And this little spring right here is your cassette spring, which helps keep it properly aligned for the film to come out, but also keeps it aligned when the film is being rewound so that the film moves in and out of the cassette smoothly. And then on the door right here is a little doodad that allows you to push it down to take the door off of the camera, put it back on. That's very useful for cleaning. Also allows you to put things like a date back on the camera, although if I remember correctly, all of the date backs for this camera only went up to like the year 19 something or maybe the early 2000s at most. So they don't record accurate dates anymore at all. They're also really big and bulky. I 
I don't recommend getting a date back for one of these because it, it adds a lot of weight and size and needs a second battery. And it eats up your flash PC port right here, which I missed on the front of the camera because it needs to know when to imprint the date and that's how it does it. One other thing about this camera, uh, if you have it, a handful of fairly obscure lenses cannot be used on this camera and have the meter function as well. So we're not talking about that they can't mount on the camera, that they'll break the camera, something like that, but that the meter will not function. And those are the FL mount 19 millimeter 3.5, 35 millimeter 2.5, 50 millimeter 1.8, which is this guy right here, which I was going to do stop down metering with. We'll see if that actually works or not. The 58 millimeter 1.2 and then the older R mount, not the modern R mount, but the really old R mount 35, 25, 51, 8, and 100, 20. So if you have any of those lenses, I'm betting you probably don't. They won't work and allow the meter to work on this camera at the same time. Some things not to do with your Canon AE-1. Don't store the camera with the shutter ready to fire. It's an electromagnetic shutter, but there are still springs and such. So before you store your camera, trigger the shutter and that will take any tension off any of the springs and then you can put it away for the night or the week or whatever. Also, if you're gonna let it sit for more than a few days, you want to take the battery out, not because anything bad is going to happen in a few days, but if it's easy, set it aside for a few days and then that few days becomes a whole lot longer and that's when it becomes a problem. So the batteries in this, the PX28, tend not to leak, but when they do, it's a serious mess. Um, so do take the batteries out of this before, store, before storing it for more than a couple of days. Do not touch the shutter or the mirror. So don't put your fingers on the mirror because that's a really good way to desilver the mirror and that will impair your metering and impair your ability to focus. Also, don't touch the shutter curtain because that's a really good way to brick your camera and render the shutter completely useless, which is a fairly expensive repair because it is a complete dismantling of the camera. Don't leave your camera or lenses in your car because heat can damage them. If heat gets on to get, uh, affects the camera, the oil and lubricants in it get very thin and get onto the lens aperture or within the mechanisms of the camera. And then when they get back to their proper viscosity, the aperture doesn't work as smoothly. Other parts of the ca camera don't work as smoothly. So heat can really permanently damage your lenses and camera without them going in to be cleaned and, um, and have new lubricants applied. Also cold can cause the lubricants in them to become really thick and gummy and just absolutely break down and then they don't return to their normal viscosity and then your camera doesn't function properly for that reason. And also, leaving a camera in a car is a, even for just a few minutes at like a gas station or a rest stop or whatever is a really good way to come out to a broken window and no camera. So I strongly recommend not leaving this in your car overnight or if you're just popping in to grab a bite to eat after a shoot, just grab your camera bag and take it with you. Uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, as they say. Don't store your camera in a plastic bag or box unless you have a rechargeable desiccant pack in with it. And the reason is because plastic's permeable, moisture will get into that plastic, and moisture will cause fungus to grow on your lens optics or to get into the covering here of your camera, which will make it smell very musty. And with as close as this covering is to your nose, you do not want your camera to smell musty. Also don't let your camera get wet because the Canon AE-1 is not weather sealed and water getting into the electronics here can short your flex. And like we talked about earlier, that is the end of your camera. It's just replacing it with a new one when the flex goes bad. And just remember your Canon AE-1 is a precision tool and should be handled with care and respect. And as long as you take care of your Canon AE-1, your Canon AE-1 will take care of you. So that's what we had for video one. In video two, we're gonna go over all of these functions and talk about how to do everything, including taking a picture with this camera so that you can take it out and know what you're doing with it.
Thank you for watching this video. Please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know that I'm on the right track producing content which is useful and helpful to you. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the comments section below. I'm pretty good about checking these every couple of days and answering questions. If you have any suggestions or ideas for future videos, and if I have the technical know-how and equipment, I'm more than happy to make those. One last thing, thank you everyone for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. I gotta get up, Steinbeck. I have to turn off the camera.